Okay, on to the actual review. Did you guys know that the Metal Virus Plague was originally planned as an Archie Sonic concept? Yeah, towards the end of that comic's run, it was slowly built up following the reboot, being Eggman's replacement to roboticizing helpless civilians. It would have made one heck of an appearance in issue number 300, being a looming threat that our heroes had never confronted before in their long history of badnik trouncing. Has the comic not been drained dry thanks to Archie's finance spending? <laughs> Among other things. Instead, the idea was shelved, and writer Ian Flynn decided to use it in IDW Sonic instead, right after the comic's first arc. <laughs> Talk about a tonal whiplash too, some of these guys had barely been introduced before being at the centre of a robot zombie apocalypse. I, I would have waited a few more arcs before dropping that one on the cast, Flynn my dude, but I digress. I've already gone into detail about my thoughts on the saga so far. In my opinion, it starts out great, and more than a little intense, but the shock value starts to fizzle out near the end with the constant tragedies. Really, the only thing that saved it was the art direction, which had no right being as great as it was. But even then, it wasn't all the time. Did the whole Metal Virus storyline end on a high note? Uh, probably, I mean, I'm glad they did. After all the trauma they put new Sonic readers through, <laughs> anything other than an overwhelmingly happy ending would have made my heart explode out of my freaking forehead, dude. Well, no more beating around the bush. This saga comes to a close, here and now. I'll try and condense my thoughts in the plot synopsis this time, so as to make my videos slightly more... digestible. It's an idea I've been trying to integrate for a while. Anywho, buckle up ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. In this video, now split into two parts FYI, we're looking at the final issues of the Metal Virus Saga. We can do this guys, I believe in me. Oh boy, this annual. <clears throat> the main cover for the 2020 annual, done by frequent Sonic Channel contributor Yui Karasuno, is lovely to look at. It's a perfect two-year celebration in visuals alone. The Four Drains variant cover of Big the Cat and Froggy <laughs> pretty much matches how I feel about these two finally appearing in this comic book. And the one with Metal Sonic by Yardley certainly makes me excited for his solo story in this annual. And the last one by Graham is so good it should be its own video game cover, <laughs> don't debate me. The two Gs, as well as writer Ian Flynn, him and Grey, draw and colour this annual's first story, Big's Big Adventure. Which, true to how the character was in the 2000s, has the dude retroactively cameo in most of the mainline issues up to this point. We saw his speech bubble in issue number 22, but before then, he's been with us since the start, apparently. Even in places we wouldn't expect, and with people who probably don't even know who the hell he was. Right up until the Metal Virus outbreak, where he protects his recently found friend from Zombots. Big kicks their asses, by the by. But after the fact, Froggy had started to turn, leaving Big to slowly succumb to the infection as he overlooks his increasingly decrepit home. The chilling vibes of this story are insane, but honestly I applaud them, <laughs> they did a good job. The tone is unnerving and chilling from start to finish, like some sort of eulogy. And the art never lets up with its use of nightmare fuel and downright haunting imagery. This is honestly a great opener just for the different point of view and the drastically different direction, uh, story-wise. So props to Flynn. Let's see how the others hold up. Darkest Hour is one drawn and written by Evan Stanley, focusing primarily on the relationship between these two radio hosts and how they help their listeners during the Metal Virus outbreak. I like these dudes, <laughs> they go by Nate the Owl and Don the Rooster, and they fit right in amongst the cast. Finally, something to flesh out the world around these guys, well, other than just zones and location names. Seeing the outbreak from the viewpoint of these regular people is very refreshing. And while we don't get to see much of these guys, except for their optimist and realist dynamic, I appreciate that they also contribute to the safety of the civilians through their efforts. <laughs> I enjoy that these two also argue like an old married couple, and I might be more bang on the money than I thought. <laughs> Woo! Go gay birds! Reflections is a story with almost zero dialogue, and next to Big's Big Adventure is one of the better stories in the annual, in my opinion. 
It focuses on Metal Sonic during Eggman's bid to cover the world with Metal Virus gunk, and after getting irritated at his latest defeat by Sonic, the robot marches on over to a big tank full of the stuff. We don't know exactly what he's thinking, but through visuals alone and the TV screen, we can tell that Metal Sonic is aware that his fleshy counterpart is stained in the silvery gunk, and Metal Sonic is the real Sonic in his eyes, and that leaves the murder machine surprisingly curious. The guy even hesitates, but when he decides to dip his finger in the vat and see if he gets corrupted too, needless to say, he doesn't. Metal Sonic is stunned by the prospect, and he must have been standing there for a while because Starline teleports in and snaps him out of it. Metal Sonic is told to leave, and Dr. Platypus rudely compares him to the very thing Metal is aware that he can never be. End of story. <laughs> Love Hammerstrom's penciling as well, and I commend writer Goelna for writing a way better story than Jet Set Radio. Metal Sonic is a villain full of potential, and I'm chuffed that we get to see some of his hidden depths and insecurities. What's the next story in this awesome lineup? Eggman's Day Off. Meh. This one is alright. Written by Sonic newcomer Sarah Grawley and drawn by Wells, this story has Dr. Starline stumble upon Eggman's secret nerd cave, where he makes a toys and the like, most likely a leftover from when he was Mr. Tinker. Starline sees an action figure in the likeness of him as a zombot, and Eggman kicks him out. A very odd story. It's totally in line with Eggman being a childish goober every now and then. <laughs> Let's let the man have his downtime between fights but I'm a little conflicted with this being the way he works out his strategies. But then again, this being like early IDW Eggman, it's, I guess it's in line with his character. The Starline toy at the end, <laughs> I'm not certain if Eggman made that because he planned to betray him later, or if he just saw him as another Nermi action figure to build. And why was he yelling out of nowhere at the start? It's rather confusingly structured, and the art is just as inconsistent. Sometimes the expressions and poses are decent, Curry's colouring notwithstanding, Sometimes the style gets a little more stretchy and psychedelic, and, um, that's that's a tracing of Ben Bates' art from Archie Sonic. No tracing art. Bad Wells. All in all, this is just a, a story. The last two are more in-between the main issues ones, but they are about the same quality, so I'll go over them together. Flock Together has the Chaotix go after Charmy B so that they can be together again. Very bad in hindsight. <coughs> and the catalyst showed what happened in Spiral Hill Village during the metal virus hitting the place, starring Jewel and that kid from the Sonic fan club. In the first story, newcomer Sam King writes the characters fine, I just don't like the characters putting everyone in danger just to contain one zombie. It's not beneficial to anybody, and Pepper's art continues to be not as emotive as you would expect these guys to be, save for some key moments. I don't feel this story adds anything at all, except for giving a reason that Charmy is there later. The Catalyst is a little better, with Jewel taking a kind of babysitting role for these kids as the egg splooser comes to town. Dutrix and Bulma make the best in-between story that they can make, but in the end it only exists to show how Tangle got infected before Sonic and Co showed up, a thing we could clearly gauge from dialogue. But I like Jewel's fluffy zombot antennae. A lot of good, but also a lot of not so great. Uh, 7 out of 10, closer to an 8 than a 6. Alright, that's the annual done with. Everyone all caught up? Good, good, because it's mainline issue time, baby. Sonic, me old pal, I think it's time we got you some help. It's not healthy to finger paint with the bloody stuff. Stanley's near-perfect 3D-inspired covers continue to be a marvel for the eyes, and I appreciate the Zeti showing up as crude carcatures in the background, even though to me it mostly just looks like they got our blue boy falsely imprisoned. The twin variant covers this time are certainly more eye-catching, be it Hammerstrom and Graham's one with the heroes and the Deadly Six clashing while Sonic stands sternly in the foreground, or the one by Fordrain where everyone begs Dr. Eggman for the Wi-Fi password. Issue number 26, All or Nothing Part 1. If my lack of enthusiasm for these Deadly Six focused stories tell you anything, it's that, well, the next few issues are going to become very formulaic very fast. like. Do you remember the first few issues of IDW Sonic? Yeah, tell me if you've seen this before. Each part of All or Nothing follows a strict formula throughout, giving them a feeling of unchanging static. Even the characters' witty and enjoyable dialogue and vibrant art couldn't shake off the feeling, though the different variety of characters to focus on somewhat dissipates the boredom. 
For one thing, I like seeing Tails and Eggman work together for a greater cause, even if it's just a temporary alliance, and it doesn't stop the villain from tormenting our hero every chance he gets. Heh <laughs> flip you, Sonic! As the introduction segment, this issue sees our heroes finally come up with a method to go to multiple places at once, which would allow them to split up into groups and confront each of the Deadly Six and their controlled Zombot armies. It starts with Bodyguard Jamil and a very rebellious Cream teleporting to Sunset City, here to confront Xena and unwittingly giving her yet another mech to command. Rouge goes behind Zevok's back to get coordinates, which is how they learned the location of the bad guys in the first place, from Orbot and Cubot, the two of which doing a bang-up job keeping their new boss distracted. Tails and Amy Rose, admittedly quite endearingly, attempt to persuade Zomom to stop tormenting those at Vista View, with predictable results. Espio goes after Zaz on his own at Riverside, though apparently the Zeti can s sniff him out easily? No, literally, he catches him entirely through the power of his nose. I suppose grief does come with a distinct scent. Silver and Whisper go after Zor, with the creepy bugger being immune to the former's telekinesis and hammy hero talk, as the Babylon rogues are tasked with tussling with the tenacious Master Zik, who proceeds to literally school them while commandeering one of their hoverboards. Just about every good guy group seems to be in peril one way or another, most of which pays off in the next issue. But you know who isn't in any of the action? <laughs> Sonic. Poor lad. Now, considering his metal virus condition has come to the point where he quickly gets reinfected immediately after standing still, he's stuck just running on a treadmill back at Angel Island. Though this does allow for some one-sided small talk with metal. It's more of a lampshade on how Metal Sonic is forever a villain, but it's intriguing seeing more of this aggressive side to the blue blur. One where he gets progressively more sick of villains continuing to do bad things when time and time again he tries to persuade them to live peacefully. I know it's still like a controversial personality trait for Sonic in this comic. At least Eggman shows up to be a proud dad for a bit. I may be hyping it up more than it's worth, but this typical middle ground story does have its fun little moments here and there, mostly in the art department and Flynn's poignant snippets of introspective dialogue. Quick rapid fire for the little, neat little things I liked. Um, Sonic retorting back to Eggman and reminding the villain that he does have the capacity to be good, Cream continuing to demand that she be more involved in the mission despite her age and promptly charging right on in, Espio taking some notes from Woodman as he heads on out, Jet being a cocky little bugger in the heat of battle but being put to the test by Master Zick to see if he values his teammates as much as he does showing off, and well, anything on this panel at the start. The rogues looking all bored, Silver's endearing expression, and Knuckles being like, what? The art is also consistently good. I believe every page featuring the main heroes was done by Stan Lee, while Trumantano did the ones where the Deadly Six were featured. And while a tad's jarring on first read, it makes for an impressive change from the familiar fluffy cast goofing around to the chaotic mess that is the Zeti and their territory. This issue is overall a little bit of a tired tread with a whole bunch of very lovable characters going off to fight the Deadly Six, a bunch of baddies who barely have more than one primary personality trait. It's not the worst issue I've ever read, but it does make for a somewhat predictable one. In the end, I'd give it an average 6 out of 10. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and while this issue follows the same story structure as number 25, this next one takes a shocking turn. Right on the get-go, this cover showcases the central themes of this arc, depressing zombie apocalypses, fighting Zeti, and the loss of innocent lives. Well, loss is a pretty harsh word for it, they're all fine in the end. Nobody ever dies in this comic, right? This cover isn't bad, but you know what's better? The other four covers that they made specifically for this issue. Why so many? The two Gs give us another giant cast showcase as they play the Sega Saturn. Love this one. Four Drains variant is extremely decent, though I admire the full picture with the next issue's cover a little more than its individual parts. Stanley's convention exclusive one gives us all the fun vibes, even if uh, that thing makes a cameo. And the one by Archie veteran Ben Bates is appealing in its simplicity. But this issue is anything but simple. Oh boy, is it. Issue number 27, All or Nothing Part 2. As identified on the main cover, the focus is primarily on the Tails and Cream groups as they confront their respective Zeti adversaries. Zomom poses a surprising threat to Amy and the Fox, as he's far too strong to take down and too dumb to outwit. 
but with their teamwork, they're able to avoid the Zombot Horde and eventually impale the bugger with the town's gate. Score one for the good guys. <laughs> what a brutal way to go out, though he seems unfazed by the whole experience. For now, them Zeti be hungry. The other half of the story focuses on Cream and Jamel, part of the conflict centering on the latter being controlled multiple times by Xena's necromancy powers, to coin a phrase. Despite everything, Cream is able to talk some sense into the Protector Bot, showing the makeup obsessed Zeti what for, but she is soon knocked about, held up by her bunny ears, and left to be taken by the Zombot mob. However, Jamel isn't going to let that slide, as they work together to nab the Chaos Emerald from her abdomen, and also leading to one of the most brutal beatdowns in all of Sonic. Jamel isn't going to take Cream's cruel treatment lightly, so he flash steps behind Xena, swings her by her hair, and yeets her into the now uncontrollable horde, giving us the only panel of Azeti in mid Zombot transformation. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's metal as heck. More of this, please. <laughs> but it's a very hollow victory. You see, Cream got a boo boo, and considering it was from an infectious Zombot, that means the little girl is swiftly on her way to becoming one. Look at how Jamel hesitates. This really gets to me because this reprogrammed bodyguard used to see Zombots as just hostiles to be blown up, right? It took until Cream talked some sense into him to even consider them innocents. And I disliked this guy. I went on record saying that he was a bland robot stereotype, a case of character regression that went too far, if you if you accounted for Archie Sonic anyway. I think at this point, I had started to warm up to him in Cream's dynamic because all that hostile programming, it dissipates completely once he's aware she'll become a Zombot. Jamel strategically tosses the Chaos Emerald back to base, takes Cream away from danger, and proceeds to keep her safe for the remainder of the saga. The dialogue here also just breaks my heart, but in a good way. This issue ends, as you'd expect, with a big ol' hook for the upcoming final fight. Sonic and Eggman are all alone, and now Zavok in the face ship has arrived. And man, that's fearsome and all, and it's always lovely seeing Holmes colour in sunsets, but really, no amount of combat nor drama could be as deeply effective as the one with Cream and Jamel. The pages with these two, especially towards the end, are probably some of the most engaging moments with any Sonic characters, at least in an apocalyptic setting. Truly the moody Metal Virus saga at its highest potential. The rest of the issue is a decent read, but nothing too special. The art by Stanley and Bryce Thomas are terrific as always, even if the colouring can get a little grazing what with the constant greys. I do like the detail in the Zombots right now, where the virus is beginning to make them mutate even more. What were once basically shiny versions of the characters and NPCs are now growing more spikes, and the artists make very good use of jagged edges and give their mouths these horrific looking maws. I like seeing the Zombots grow more visually threatening as the comic goes on. I feel like this issue is a cut above the other ones by a wide margin, though I shan't rate it too high because it's not wholly great. <sighs> Screw it. I'm gonna let my monkey brain enjoy the effective tragedies and give this issue an 8 out of 10. A high point for the saga, though I dare say we won't see any more chillingly heart-hitting pages such as these. Nonetheless, let's continue to the next part. Check out the two purple lads duking it out. Welcome to the team, artist Abby Bulmer. These two characters aren't exactly my favourites, but they do look neat on a cover together. I particularly like Zaz's smirk. Curry's one of Silver and Whisper is very nice. I really, really dig the shading on these two. And Fordrain's variant is cool with Zor in it too. Uh, <laughs> I think I just prefer the covers where the Deadly Six aren't in it as much. Issue number 28, All or Nothing Part 3. Silver's over at Orchardville, dealing with emo boy's shadow clone Jutsu. I didn't mean to do that. And good thing Whisper's around to cover his six, because if I was fighting this guy, I too might lower my guard, as I punch him in the dick. With the Whispin shot bouncing off crystals, and with Silver's assistance, all lovingly drawn by Bryce Thomas, and it looks fantastic by the way, <laughs> Zor has the Chaos Emerald knocked out of him, leading him to succumb to his uh, darkly accepting fate. Stay creepy, numbnuts. Well, that Zeti fell quick. I guess they're whizzing through the remaining bad guy's desk before the finale. Well, I'll keep up the pace, because looky here, it's the bugger from the cover. The purple guy tussles with the chameleon for a little while, but it's a very stealthy affair, a lot of back and forth. Zaz implies that he gets physically abused, and soon after, Espio swipes the Chaos Emerald from his chest. Score another one for the good guys. The most intense battle goes to the Babylon Rogues and Master Zig, 
While the talking bean holds his friends captive, Jet stands firm as he is berated by enemies and allies alike, but his confidence allows him and his teammates to fight on. Jet actually decides to send their last remaining extreme gear back with the retrieved Chaos Emerald, meaning these guys, as precocious as they are, are most likely infected by the end of this issue. But boy do they go down fighting. I'm not kidding, there's a good moment for these guys. Speaking of the end, and guys, the multi-portal generator returns the heroes, and the Chaos Emeralds left by those who could not come back for the party. Man, these dudes will never catch a break as long as this arc continues. In a little worrying monologue, Silver reveals that the fact that the metal virus is still around in the future means that they most likely failed their mission in the present. But maybe Future Boy being here could revert that? Zavok and the face ship gain closer to Angel Island, but Rouge puts a stop to whatever Zavok is planning and takes the ship's Chaos Emeralds, the only remaining object powering the thing. Goodbye, face ship. You died as you lived, making me question your very concept. However, who is still alive but Zavok? And remember how he could turn into a giant Bowser form in Lost World? Well, with his individual Chaos Emeralds, he gains a beastly second form, capable of chucking the infected Zombots at people and spitting fireballs. Knuckles does not approve. The issue ends with some familiar faces returning, leaving Sonic at a loss for words and opening one hell of a final act to this dreary story arc. As expected, the story is very much like the last one. The conflict between the heroes and the Deadly Six are spread across bunches of pages, though with this issue focusing on three groups instead of two, it leaves them all finishing a little abruptly with nary a slimmer of satisfaction. Each part gets like three to five pages total, and that's already too many pages dedicated to the Deadly Six. I'm sorry, but I still feel they play too much into their cartoonish stereotypes. It's not to say that the cast were handled poorly, I enjoyed a couple moments here and there. Whisper and her wisps one-shotting Zor, Espio reminiscing fondly on his missing friends, and the rogues going up like total rogues were all very good moments. It's just a shame the story grazes over them all so fast that what shred of character moments, particularly those from the severely lacking Deadly Six, kind of get pushed aside in favour of the mission quickly wrapping up. It's very muddly. Is that a word? The art is both good and average to me. The line art by Stanley and Bryce Thomas is of good quality, no complaints here, but with Herm's colouring being so impressive and visually stimulating, it kind of makes Unger's more flat by comparison. Not to say that she's a bad colourist, I even appreciate her Archisonic contributions, but whenever things get visually dark, all sense of depth and colourful splendour is lost a little bit. It makes it very easy for me to lose interest. The art is great overall, but it and the predictable story beats left me just a little bit dreary. I say a little bit, I mean a lot. So this issue gets a rating of 6 out of 10. Not enough to be a 7 because I'm a tired boy and too much lingering depresso in my Sonico makes my brain go numbo. Oh. Hi, Future Robotic Homes here. This video was split into two parts because it's freaking long as heck and I'm tired. So, <laughs> so I'm here to say, uh, check out the next issue. It's going to be probably bigger than this one and it's going to have the remaining metal virus issues, so hope you guys like that. Thank you ever so much for watching, if indeed you still are, and I'll see you in the next video. It's in his f***ing forehead!